Got to record. Okay. Page 306, top of the page. All right. Lesson 24, part three. So today, when a poor sinner reaches out the hand of faith and places it, as it were, on the head of the Lord Jesus Christ and says, I recognize that the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. I am crucified with him in his sacrifice. Now, he is talking about, you, you'll remember uh, that video we watched, was it last week or the week before, about the, uh, the Day of Atonement sacrifice where they bring the two goats in and they lay hands on the one goat to place all the sins on that goat for the year of these people. And then the other goat, they take him out into the wilderness and let him go. All right, but that's what Dr. Ironside is referring to. Then the soul is saved as these brethren laid hands on Saul and Barnabas. They said, in effect, brethren, we are one with you and the, with you in this missionary enterprise. You go out into the regions beyond and we shall stay by you and by you here at home. You go down into the dark caverns of the earth and seek to find the gold and precious things that shall adorn the crown of our Lord Jesus Christ in the ages to come. And we will hold the ropes and look after your temporal needs and pray. Morning, Jason. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia. And from thence, they sailed to Cyprus. Notice that while the, that while the church had full fellowship with them in their going out, we are told we are not told uh, they were sent by the church. They did not get their commission from the church, but from the risen Lord who had told them to go into all the world. And we, of course, will remember also that the Holy Ghost actually said, to, for them to go on this mission. So this, this mission is ordained of, not only is it ordained by Jesus who said, go into all the world, preach the gospel, but it's also ordained by the Holy Spirit who told him to send these men to prepare them for this work, to send them on this work. And uh, you'll, you know, continuing on at the bottom of the page here, you know, some people talk as though this were a question of mission, as though this question of missions is a mere matter in which the church may decide whether it is wise or not. But we have nothing to say about that. It is perfectly plain and clear. It was the Lord who said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am all, I am with you always, even unto the even unto the consummation of the age. Some years ago, there were there was a great missionary rally in the Royal Albert Hall in London, England, and a clergyman turned to the Duke of Welling turned to the Duke of Wellington, the Iron Duke, whose armies had defeated Napoleon and asked, my Lord Duke, do you believe in, in missions? What are your marching orders? Asked the Duke. Of course, the Bible says to go into all the world, answered the clergyman. Then you have nothing to say about it. As a soldier, you are to obey orders. And that is true of the, of the church down through the centuries, down to the end of the dispensation. It is the Lord who commands us to go. Bless you, honey. It is the Lord who commands us to go. It is the Lord who sends his workers out. And the church is to have fellowship with them to the uttermost of its ability. Seleucia was a city on the seacoast. From there, they sailed for Cyprus. Doubtless, the heart of Barnabas was exercised about Cyprus. Born there, he, it was his former home. We can understand him saying, I should like to go first to my island home and tell the people 
there about the matchless grace of God as revealed in Jesus Christ. And then they were, and then they were at Salamis. They preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, but at first did not find an opening to go to the Gentiles. The, the John referred to in verse five is John Mark, cousin of Barnabas and son of Mary of Jerusalem, a rich woman with a large house where many of the early, many of the early services were held. John Mark was the author of the second gospel. So he wrote the gospel of Mark. And when they had gone through the aisle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus, a renegade Jew who had gone out among the Gentiles pretending to be a marvelous wonder worker and thereby trying to profit. He took the name Bar Jesus, as Bar Jesus, as Bar means son. His name really meant, as we've said, son of Jesus. He undoubtedly heard of the Lord Jesus Christ and his miracles, how he had healed the blind and unstopped the ears of the deaf, mentioned the name, mention of the name, mention of that name, sorry, had been heard here and there throughout the world. Now, this is going to be point 4A in our lesson outline. Let's see here. Point 4A in our lesson outline, and it is, he said, I am the son of Jesus and am able to work wonders even as he did, okay? He was there with the counselor of the country, Sergius Paulus. Paulus is exactly the same name as Paul. Uh, and it is interesting to note that from time to time, on we, on we never read again of Saul. It is as though Paul took the name of his first illustrious convert. Now there is, uh, nobody really knows how uh, Paul, how Saul ended up with a Greek name and a Jewish name. Traditionally, it's thought that Paul's parents may have had uh, military service in their background or in some other way became and and we know though that Paul is a Roman citizen, so that would explain the name Paul. And if you ever saw the movie Ben Hur with Charlton Heston, you'll see that when Ben Hur was adopted by uh, oh, what's that guy's name? Uh, ben Hur was adopted by a Roman proconsul or something. I forget the guy was a military leader, so this guy adopted Ben Hur, and Ben Hur, whose name was Judah Ben Hur then became, uh, was given a Roman name or issued a Roman name as it were, which was Arius, okay? So uh, in some way, Paul became a Roman citizen also, but it's not clear. Uh, people have, there are a lot of theories out there flying around about it, but the truth of the matter is nobody knows how he became a citizen, all right? So, all right, now that said, all right, we never read of Saul again, but so Paul is referred to at this point in the scripture, we don't hear of him talked about as being Saul anymore. He's Paul, the apostle Paul. Okay, so Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear a word of God. But Elemus, the sorcerer, and Elemus is Bar Jesus, same guy. The sorcerer the wicked renegade withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, here is the charge, uh, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief. Man, I would love to see this, you know, to see what, what this scene, the way it played out. Because I'm telling you, when Paul locked eyes on this guy, I'll bet his skin was just crawling. But uh, then Saul, okay, so he said, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, oh, full of all subtlety 
and all mischief, thou child of the devil. It is a slightly different word than that generally translated child. In the original, it means son. Okay, so this word child, this word child is means son. Okay, now this is going to be point five in our lesson outline, and it is it's it is uh, from Acts, from the Acts chapter thirteen here, and it is it says, "Thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord?" Now this word pervert is G1294 in the Strong's system, and it means to distort, to misinterpret, or to corrupt morally, and that's one, that's our defined term for this lesson. Now, uh, and that is Acts 13, verse 10. Okay, now, uh, the word pervert that Paul uses seems to indicate that Elemas was indeed claiming connection to the person, possibly the message, and certainly the power of Jesus. Therefore, Paul says he is perverting the right ways of the Lord. So the man is trying to link his own self with the, the identity of Jesus Christ and everything that, that Jesus means when people hear the name of Jesus. You know, all the great things he did, the miraculous power he had, and so forth. Okay, now think about this. Now, this is interesting. Now, Sergius Paulus, all right? Now, Sergius Paulus, up to this point, had been listening to Bar Jesus, the so-called son of Jesus, right, honey? All right, so he'd been listening to this Bar Jesus, the so-called son of Jesus, all right, now Sergius Paulus realize, knows that this man is claiming to be Jesus, or be the son of Jesus, that is, all right? So this prudent man, now the word prudent actually means wise. Uh, the word prudent, it means, uh, is actually defined in the strong system as sagacious. And that word is defined in Webster's 1828 dictionary as having or showing keen mental discernment, good judgment being shrewd. Now, I said before in the lesson that this Sergius Paulus was a man who knew and accepted the idea that there was something greater out there than himself. And him associating himself with these odd characters like uh, Elimus is evidence that he knows that there's something else out there. All right. Now, he is misguided in his association with Elimus, of course, but he having heard, okay? Now, uh, consider this. Uh, Sergius Paulus, this prudent man, so he's a wise man, said in Acts, uh, as said in Acts 13, verse 7, apparently believed Bar this Bar Jesus person enough to keep him close as a counselor of sorts. Okay, Sergius Paulus was a wise man. This is, this is obvious. All right. Who knew there must be something greater out there than himself. All right. Then comes along Saul and Barnabas, who also claim affiliation with this miracle worker, Jesus. Now, take a second and think about this. Sergius Paulus has this man in his court. OK, who's claiming to be the son of Jesus, who's claiming to have Jesus's power and whatnot, right? To what extent, we don't know. But the idea that his name is son of Jesus and it is expressed that way shows us that this man is claiming direct identification with that, with Jesus and his power, okay? Now, Sergius Paulus hears about Saul and Barnabas who are also claiming to be affiliated with this person, Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to think about this. It should be considered that Sergius Paulus had not even contemplated that there may be some conflict between these two supposed servants of Jesus. So when, when Sergius Paulus sent 
for Paul and Barnabas, he may not have been expecting there to be any issue between these people. Then again, he may have. Who knows? We really don't know. It's just interesting to contemplate. Uh, another thing to consider is this. It may be that Sergius Paulus may have noticed some inconsistencies in this sorcerer or so-called son of Jesus when he compared him with what he was hearing about the ministry of Saul and Barnabas. Now, we know he was hearing about the ministry of Saul and Barnabas because he sent for Saul and Barnabas. That's obvious, right? All right, so Sergius Paulus was set to have a revelation moment, all right? And if you've ever been born again, and I know you, I know many of you have, all right, then you've had that revelation moment at some point too, right, honey? <laughs> all right, so let's see here. Paul called him the son of the devil, all right. In withstanding Elimus the sorcerer, Paul was acting for God because this man was seeking to hinder the salvation of Sergius Paulus. Okay. Now, trying to do just that, Paul spoke to him as he did. Son of the devil, he called him. All right. Now, this is point 5A in our lesson outline. Paul called him the son of the devil in order to solve a problem. One must first identify the offending issue. Now, we will all know this, of course. Anybody who owns a vehicle is aware that when you, when you have a problem with your car and it needs maintenance of some sort, it's, it's not handling right, driving right, won't start, whatever, you take it to an auto mechanic, and the first thing the mechanic does is diagnose it. So he's trying to identify the problem so that he can address the problem effectively and efficiently, right? or at least we hope he's going to address the problem effectively and efficiently. All right. Then and only then can one take corrective effective action. Paul calls out the malfunction, the malfunction in no uncertain terms. You are not the son of Jesus, but the son of the devil. All right. So Paul locks eyes on this man and tells him that his identification is completely wrong. He is identifying with Jesus when he is really linked with the devil. Okay. The truth of this proclamation and Paul's authority under Christ are confirmed by the blindness that befalls Elimus. Okay. So that the blindness that befalls Elimus is a confirmation of truth that Paul and, and Barnabas are sharing, all right, of, proclama of Saul's, uh, Paul's proclamation against the Lemus, okay? The Spirit of God never used, it to, you never used a term like that of ordinary saved men. So Dr. Ironside is saying that the Spirit of God doesn't, Dr. Ironside saying that the Spirit of God does not just willy-nilly jump out there and call people the son of the devil, all right? This is a special term, and uh, he goes on to say that the Spirit of God is used, is never, the, the Spirit of God never uses a term like that of ordinary unsaved men. The Lord Jesus said of certain, of certain ones of his day, you are of your father the devil. He did not address everybody like that, but only those who deliberately and definitely set themselves to oppose <clears throat> the divine program. In the first epistle of John, the apostle speaks of Cain and Abel and says, in this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his, neither he that loveth not his brother. Okay, now this is going to be point six in our lesson outline, and it's that all men by nature are children of wrath, but no man is called the child of the devil unless he deliberately gives himself to satanic propaganda and takes a stand as a positive enemy of God. Okay, continuing on, that is the, pla that is the place 
Elimus the sorcerer took, and Paul invoked a judgment on him for that. Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. Now, this is interesting. Uh, th this is going to be point 6a in our lesson outline. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. The physical judgment, get this, this is powerful. The physical judgment which had fallen on him was the expression of the darkness of this man's soul. Now, there are some interesting things going on with this, with this blindness. Now, it's nothing we can really put our finger on. But if we look at Paul's blindness in Acts 9, verse 3, Paul was blinded, and, and the text reads, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. Now, we will, of course, remember that Paul was on his way to Damascus to, to round up Jews, all right, who, to round up Christians. Uh, and he wanted to kill them, put them to the sword, drag them before the judge, and all this nonsense. And, and uh, Acts 9, 3 says, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. Okay. Now, I have a video I'd like to share with you. Let's see here. Which one is this? Ultraviolet keratitis, UV keratitis, welder's flash, arc eye, or snow blindness. Photokeratitis is a very painful eye injury caused by intense exposure to either natural or artificial ultraviolet radiation in the setting of inadequate eye protection. In essence, the injury is like an intense sunburn of the surface of the eye. Common causes include welders who fail to wear adequate UV blocking eye protection while welding, known as arc eye or welder's flash or skiers, mountain climbers, or hikers who have intense exposure to sunlight reflected off ice and snow at high elevations, known as snow blindness. It can also be caused by tanning lamps. The clear surface of the eye that covers the pupil is called the cornea. The cornea has a tremendous amount of nerve endings, making it the most sensitive part of your body. When this sensitive structure is exposed to high doses of UV radiation, the radiation is absorbed by the corneal surface, leading to inflammation and punctate erosions, which cause severe pain. The best treatment is prevention. To prevent photokeratitis, it is very important to protect your eyes from dangerous ultraviolet radiation exposure by always wearing the appropriate UV blocking eye protection. If you're welding, wear a welding mask. If you're skiing or hiking at high altitudes, wear sunglasses or goggles with high rates of UV absorption that fit well and have side shields. In the sun, consider wearing a wide-brimmed hat. When resources are limited, you could also consider using dark soil or marker under your eyes, like football or baseball players do, to reduce glare. Flash burn can be prevented and should be treated if you are suffering from it. If the flash burn is not treated, an infection may start. This can be serious and may lead to some loss of vision. There's usually a delay between the exposure to the UV source and the onset of symptoms. 12 hours. Okay, so you get the point. If Paul would have had a welding shield on, I don't know. <laughs> so, but Paul was Paul was blinded by intense light, right? So, all right. So that's what happens when you're blinded by intense light. It just it literally destroys your eyes, and that's what happened to Paul. Okay, the Bible says that Saul was blinded. It, it de demonstrates that Saul was blinded by intense light surrounding, probably radiating from the risen, glorified Christ. And you could check out Acts 9 3 if you want to check that out later. It's fine. Uh, in Saul's experience, he was blinded by light that shined down from heaven. In Elimus's experience, 
immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness. Elimus was blinded as if a thick fog came down around him. Now, I'm not exactly sure what that means. But maybe I have a video here that might help us to kind of understand, might help to demonstrate this. I'm not sure. Let's see here. Find my video. I think this must be something like what Alimas may have been experiencing, but obviously worse than this. Okay, so continuing on with Dr. Ironside's commentary of this, he says, when Sergius Paulus saw this and saw how Alimus was confounded before the messenger of the true gospel, we're told he believed, <clears throat> being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. And that's an important point because he didn't believe because of the miracle per se. The miracle confirmed what he was believing. Does that make sense? Okay, so the miracle confirms it. The mir people don't believe because of the miracle, really. They believe the message. The, the miracle confirms the message as true. All right, you'll find that through, all throughout the Bible. Uh, he was astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. And so this was their, and so this was their first Gentile convert on their first missionary journey. All right. He was a man of position and authority, and his conversion doubtless meant a great deal in the island of Cyprus. Uh, the people generally would say the proconsul had accepted the new message. He has received the gospel and now believes in the and now believes in this Jesus, whom Paul also, uh, whom Paul and Barnabas preached. Many were no doubt impressed. Now, it should be pointed out at this juncture that uh, Christian tradition says that this man, Elimus, received Jesus as a savior later. Now, it's not in the Bible, but it is believed as a matter of tradition that that is what happened based on what the text says, okay? Because it says that he would be blinded for a season and people equate that to him being blinded and then seeing the light, I guess. But his uh, Christian tradition, as Bruce Gore said, uh, says that this Alemus man became a Christian after this incident. All right. Uh, we are told in verse 13, they came back to the mainland. They had finished their work in Cyprus for a time, for the time being. Cyprus, however, was visited later by Barnabas, who spent some time there. Now, I want to show you the map again. 
Okay. Okay, so Paul and Barnabas started out here in Antioch. They went to Seleucia. Then they went to, this is the island of Cyprus, okay? So you'll remember they went to Salamis first, then to Paphos. Now, Paphos is where this incident with Elimus and Sergius Paulus is happening. That's where this is happening. And then, as our text continues on to say, now, when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia. And Perga is here, and Pamphylia, the larger region, okay? So that's where they, that's where they are now. And uh, let's see here. Now, when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia. This was a mountainous country, difficult to reach. <clears throat> And now we are told that John departed from them, returned and returned to Jerusalem. The Spirit of God does not tell us why, yet it does seem hard to read. It does doesn't seem hard to read between the lines. We shall see as we go on. The apostle felt there was no legitimate reason for this young man to leave them, and therefore he was blame, he was blameworthy. John Mark, you know was the son of a rich woman. That isn't always the best start in life, Dr. Ironside says, to be born with a silver spoon in your mouth. He had been sheltered and perhaps coddled all of his, all his days. And when his cousin Barnabas went into missionary work, <clears throat> he, was, he was impressed and desired to go along too. But when he found himself in difficult circumstances, perhaps he contrasted his discomforts with the claim and agreeable atmosphere he had left in Jerusalem. He would think, mother would never let me suffer like this. <clears throat> now, this is an opinion of Dr. Ironside, I'm not saying this is exactly what happened, but it could be, we don't know. So when Perga, as he, as he looked, Okay, so when at Perga, he looked at the high mountain range and thought of the stress and strain of what lay ahead. A great spasm of homesickness came over him, and he determined to give up the work. Okay, so, so John Mark left them at that point. All right, Paul did not approve of that. He felt this business of missions was not merely a junketing trip or, or some kind of a vacation. It was, a, it was not a matter of going to foreign lands just to see strange people and places. It was a tremendously serious matter, calling for true soldierly bearing, and he felt John Mark had failed in this and was unworthy of, confident, of the confidence of Barnabas and did not quite share, uh, Barnabas did not quite share this view, okay? As you know, he was closely related to John Mark. Well, we leave him now. He doubtless made a mistake. Later, God allowed him to rectify his action, and he became a devoted servant, a devoted servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have, so we have here the beginning of Christian missions, and we can thank God that through the centuries since, this work has continued. For a period, the church seemed to forget its responsibility but during the last 150 years, there has been a greater awakening in the Church of God toward missionary effort. And again, we can thank God for having put upon the hearts of so many a burden for the lost world. Now, that concludes the reading portion of our lesson. And that concludes, that will conclude lesson 24 in the book. All right, now I have some questions that I would like us to consider. Okay, now question number one, Dr. Ironside says regarding missions, he says this ought always to be the attitude of those toward those who carry out the message to the uttermost parts. Now, why should we be willing to support modern day missionaries? 
point. Anyone have any thoughts on that? Fulfill the Great Commission. The uh, those who sin get the same reward as those who go. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Marcia. All right, I have a video here for you. Now, uh, are there, let's see here. Uh, I got another video I want to share with you too. Hold on one second. What are three practical ways that we can support missionaries right now through the local church? Uh, let me get, begin with saying that uh, your prayers are the greatest support. It taps into the greatest resource. Our missionaries really have no effectiveness apart from the Spirit of God that's working in and through them and the Spirit of God that's working in and through lost people who need to hear and believe the gospel. The prayers that you pray help in uh, plowing the ground. Uh, it's spiritual battle, really, and your prayers are an important part. Uh, praying for our missionaries uh, to be effective in their work, to have wisdom, uh, praying that those who hear uh, will have their heart convicted by the Holy Spirit and will believe. So how you pray as an individual, how you pray as a small group or as a church as a whole uh, for your missionaries really does make a difference. At imb.org, you can find uh, prayer requests constantly running. In fact, there's daily prayer requests that are shared for our IMB missionaries. Please pray for our missionaries. Also, encourage you to pray for the lost uh, around the world, uh, we're seeing a great movement of the Spirit that I believe is in part in response to the prayers of God's people. And we thank you for the prayers that you have lifted up and the prayers that you will lift up. Another way that you can support your missionaries right now is through financial support, your giving. Uh, the cooperative program uh, is our base support that provides for the mission work around the world. As your church gives through the cooperative program, uh, you not only impact ministries in your state and here in North America, but you are literally extending the reach of your church to the very ends of the earth as you're supporting missionaries and mission work through the International Mission Board. So giving. Giving also includes a great opportunity each year 
uh, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. The Lottie Moon Christmas offering is emphasized uh, during the Christmas season, but the Lottie Moon Christmas offering is receiving gifts any time. Uh, so I would encourage you to pray about, seek the Lord for what He would have you give in support of the mission work. All of the funds that are given through the Lottie Moon Christmas offering uh, for world missions, all of those funds to go directly to support the work overseas. Thank you for what you might have already given. Thank you for considering what you could give to support the mission work. That's a way that you as an individual and as a church could have a dramatic impact to the very ends of the earth. Let me also encourage you uh, to consider sending, sending a team to work alongside of our missionaries, sending students out for uh, not only short-term trips, uh, but maybe a two-year stay after they uh, have finished college or finished high school and about to go into college. There are programs through the IMB where individuals can go short-term, but career missionaries as well, and your church to be communicating, your pastor to be preaching, small groups to be talking about the need of the gospel among the nations and the opportunity that the IMB uh, can work with you to send missionaries out is a way that you, through sending, can be a part of supporting missionaries and having hands-on impact in the mission work. Thank you for all that you're already doing to work in partnership with the IMB. Uh, this is Southern Baptist Missionary Sending Agency, and if you're a part of a Southern Baptist church, it's your IMB. Every church, every nation. Okay. So the International Mission Board sends missionaries all over the world, and we, and we support that through our, our local church that we belong to. And that we give our offerings to. Okay, so if you tithe, you're already supporting missions. All right. Now he mentioned several ways that you can help to support mi the missionary effort. Can anyone else think of a way that we are supporting the missionary effort that he didn't mention? Any thoughts? No wrong answers here. I can think of one way that our church has supported uh, the missionary effort in the past. Do you remember when they took all those shoes to Ecuador that time? That's a way they they uh, supported the missionary effort down there. You remember that, honey? Uh, can anyone think of anything else the church our church has done in particular to help the missionary effort? Hey, Jason. Hello. Good to see, you, buddy. One of the ways. Good to see you too. One of the ways we've supported too, and it kind of goes along with what you were saying about the shoes is uh, when I got to go to Ecuador, we did take shoes, but our main purpose there was to uh, take the shoes to the missionaries in that area. Um, so we got to meet with them. We had lunch or dinner with them. Prepared, we prepared that all for them and gave them shoes and, and washed their feet, the foot washing and everything. So we were there to uh, just be an encouragement to them. Um, and physically go where they were. And we had the same thing when we were doing the campground ministry. Some of the folks from church would come down and just people being there to, to help you once in a while and yeah. physically just, just visit with you is really an encouragement. And that's, that's some ways that our church has helped. Yeah, that, you know, that, that connection, uh, that just that fellowship can be tremendously powerful. Uh, yesterday, I'll tell you, Jeff came over yesterday and proctored my first exam for me, and he fellowshiped with me and Kimberly for a little while, and that was just a tremendous blessing to us. I felt a whole lot better after he left when he, uh, just from having a little, you know, person-to-person, brother-to-brother fellowship, you know, in a, in a, you know, over a cup of coffee, that kind of thing can really pick you up, you know, um, but uh, what are some other ways that our church in particular supports mission work? Any thoughts? Uh, Go ahead, Ms. Marcia. Pastors working with the uh, Muslim nations. Yeah, ab absolutely. Well, I'm one on one, I think, though. Uh, I think that's more the church. We, the slaves there that time, we gathered money. And yep. we watched the video. Yep, that's right. There, they the church bought the church actually paid for for those folks to be released. Praise God. And that's controversial because of different reasons. But 
we were hoping for the best with that. Yeah. Well, you know what? If done in the right spirit, I'm sure God will, you know, God's going to work through it. You know, I mean, they're baptizing people like crazy over there. That's wonderful. <laughs> you know, if, it, if, if, they had 500 if, it, baptisms. if it's sincere, it is wonderful. If it's, well, if it's sincere, it's wonderful. I don't know. Whenever you see the gospel spreading like that, though, Marsha, very powerful. Yeah. Um, anyway, all right. So, uh, so the, the missionary effort can be supported in many ways, and it is being supported in many ways. Years ago, I read a John Grisham book. I forget what, I forget which book it was, but there was a, uh, a Southern Baptist missionary character in the book and one of the things that this character needed was a boat motor was a small boat motor to be able to get up river and uh, that was a something he pointed out in the book you know is that's not really a big deal for us in america to come to come up with something like that but if you're down there trying to get something like that it's like i mean you really need i mean it's it's something Something that would be difficult for us to get here can be next to impossible for them to get down there in countries like Ecuador and without, without help from people here, here in America. So just keep that in the forefront of your mind. And, you know, wherever you can help out, help out. It's all good, you know. God will bless you for it. That's it. Wherever you can help out, help out. There you go. It and, doesn't have uh, to be, Robert, it doesn't have to be just foreign missions it can be a mission right here you know like the paris foundation you know that's absolutely that's absolutely right miss robin and i will tell you we were tremendously blessed by the prayer shawl ministry now the situation with my mom did not go in a way that i wanted it to go but it was that prayer shawl was a blessing to us and you know just wanted to put that out there and uh so now moving on go did you have something else to add miss robin to the missions thing no i see it through the women's ministry all the time you know we were able to you know raise money to send an oven to shell ecuador and yeah. um you know through the funds to the church and just uh, the ladies really saw a miracle. And then when we wanted one of those ovens for ourselves, um, God, for our kitchen, God provided that through um, a family that had lost a loved one. Oh. So um, it was just amazing how, you know, when we give, mm. God returns the blessing. Yes, he does. Absolutely. Uh, Miss Marsha. Yeah, the uh, gospel message is on that flag and it's symbolism and uh, colors and, and the words, he will be back. Yeah. So I feel like I've got a national mission. Yeah. By raising the banner, declaring the Lord, declaring my faith in the Lord because of the symbolism on this flag with the bloodstained cross. It is not cold and polite sitting in corners. Yeah. It is it is aggressive we're told the gates of hell will not prevail against us and it declares the blood of jesus it does all of that spiritually speaking and in the eyes eyes of men that when we confess him before men he confesses us before the angels of god in heaven and we'll think about that jesus that's right miss marcia us before the angels of god in heaven and all that's needed you see somebody that needs him. I was a single mother of four and worked very long hours and getting a tank of oil, paying taxes on the house and things like that was a big deal. So if I get a little extra money here and there that's above and beyond normal, I try to look around for somebody that you can be an answer to their prayer. Yeah. If you need your rent paid, it's December. Would yeah. that help you? My kids used to get stuff they needed for Christmas, school clothes and shoes, and they were glad yeah. to get it. Yeah. If somebody had paid the house payment that month, that would have helped me get yeah. the things they needed. 
So when you say do what you can, I, I aggressively, <clears throat> when dad died, looked for people. Lord, show me. And he did. You know, it, it ran out pretty quick, mind yeah. you. But <clears throat> there was a couple of families. I, I, I feel like the Lord allowed me, that blessed me to be able to be an answer to their prayers because people crying out to Jesus, you're his hands and feet. Yeah. So those were the two aspects I wanted, you know, the raising of the banner. To me, if you haven't caught the vision, ask the Lord to give you the vision. Because yeah. I would have quit 17, 18 years ago if right. it wasn't something to this. And then the help and see who needs help and help where you can. Because people say, oh, dear God, please help me. But here you come. You just yeah. magnify Jesus. Yep, that's right. Amen. Thank you, Miss Marsha. All right. Uh, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap up. Hey, Randall, you want to pray for us, buddy? Yeah. Well, Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you again. Uh, we can come together um, as a unit, Lord, believing in you. And I want to thank you for Robert, Lord, and the time that he puts in each week. And Lord, the opportunity we've had, Lord, to uh, share with each other, Lord, uh, your word. And we thank you for that and the time that uh, Robert has put in, and may you continue to bless him and others, Lord. Uh, be with the message that will be brought and this morning, and uh, Lord, be with the pastor while he goes away, and Lord, the need there with the loss of his uh, father, Lord, uh, we continue to uphold him and his family. We thank you again for another day you've given us and the health that you give us each day, Lord. We thank you for that. And we commit the day to you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. Love you guys. Y'all have a blessed day. Enjoy the service. All right. I'll talk to you later. God bless you. Bye. Thank Goodbye. you. All right. Love you. <laughs> love you, Rick Coulter. Stay salty. Yes, sir. <laughs>